The release of Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe has been quite exciting. Already we've gotten to see Kirby and Maglor attempt to beat the game without jumping. And now today, a third challenger gives it a go. Is it possible for Bandana Waddle Dee to beat Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe without jumping? So, about the rules. You see, there isn't a neat little Waddle Dee mode in this game like we had for Maglor. So what I've devised instead is for Kirby to ride Bandana Waddle Dee around in the main mode. Here are the rules we'll be living by as we attempt this challenge. Firstly, no player characters may use the move Jump Slash Hover. Not Bandana Waddle Dee, not Kirby, and most certainly not any other players we may join in at other points in the game. On that topic, we can join in more players to complete tasks that Bandana D can't do alone, and we can even let Kirby dismount and move around and be generally helpful. That being said, in terms of physically progressing through a level, that should be done by Bandana Waddle D. Ideally with Kirby seated upon his back as often as possible. And that ought to do it for rules. So let's delay no longer and get started with stage one of Cookie Country. I guess the first thing we have to do is get Kirby riding us. Not to worry, that's easily done with this ledge over here. Now on to the level. Bandana Waddle Dee tears through these first Waddle Dees before coming across the game's jumping tutorial. I suppose now is as good a time as any to see what heat Waddle Dee is packing to get past such obstacles. Bandana Waddle Dee's moveset is very similar to Spear. As such, Bandana Waddle Dee only has one real jump replacement to speak of, the Waddle Copter. Luckily, this jump replacement is pretty good, as it's able to offer us both good height and horizontal movement with even just a single use of the move. Which brings us to one of the Waddle Copter's main weaknesses. It is, in most cases, extremely untenable to use while in the air. This means that for most intents and purposes, we cannot achieve infinite flight with Bandana Dee. That's not necessarily a deal breaker, but it is certainly inconvenient. One other inconvenience of the move is the fairly long charge required before Bandana D can actually perform the Waddlecopter. This means that Bandana D's reaction time when called upon to use the Waddlecopter on short notice isn't great. Nevertheless, the Waddlecopter is overall a pretty good jerk placement that is more than sufficient to get Bandana D over this gap, up the upcoming cliff, and all the way to this cave. Here we encounter a foe who's haunted us for years. A key. <laughs> of course, keys are generally bad because we can't use our typical jump replacements while holding them. But today they're even worse. Because as it turns out, you can't pick up a key at all while you're being ridden. Luckily in this instance, we can overcome this issue by outsourcing our key handling to a third player but I could easily see future keys not being quite so kind to us. After that, we completely ignore the super cop ability and finish the level. In stage two, combat starts becoming a bit more of an issue. The problem being that getting hit at all basically guarantees that Kirby will fall off of you. If that happens, our general policy is to remount Kirby as soon as possible. Of course, depending on the topography of the area in the level where we lost Kirby, this could be an impossibility thus necessitating a level reset. Quite annoying, but not unmanageable. And honestly, there's not much else difficult about Cookie Country after that. The Wispy Woods fight did knock Kirby off our back, but I've decided that in a boss fight, Kirby can be grounded as long as he lets Bad Dead Waddle Dee do all of the heavy lifting. Going into Raisin Roods, I finally realized that giving Kirby a copy build like Sand is actually a pretty good idea. My thought process before had been along the lines of, well, Kirby's not really doing anything aside from riding on Bandana Waddle Dee, so why bother giving him a copy ability? But I've since realized that Kirby having a jump replacement to be able to rebound Waddle Dee in the case of him falling off is actually incredibly useful. Additionally, Sand is a particularly great one since it also gives Kirby an incredible block to use to stay alive during boss fights. Anyway, as for the level itself, the boulders could have been annoying to outrun in light of the whole long charge times for the Waddlecopter thing, but they're a breeze if you stay behind them. 
Stage 2 is our first run-in with a water level. Now these are interesting since riding other players is impossible underwater. So for this underwater section, Waddle Dee will still be doing all of the work, but Kirby will need to follow along swimming behind by his own power. Overall, it goes alright. The stage culminates with this super copy ability section, in which I accidentally retrieved said super copy ability. Luckily, it wasn't difficult to navigate regardless, especially if you go around the outside on this section. Stage 3 was smooth sailing, until the section with the Gordos, that is. Ultimately, with the Waddlecopter being so slow, you've got to make sure you time your moves just right to sneak through. Stage 4 opens with a key section, which we use multiplayer teleporting to subvert. Then these sand conveyors are a menace due to how long it takes to charge the Waddlecopter. Luckily, they're not extremely fast, so it is still manageable. The stage ends with a super copyability section, which we again ignore. Though I will say in this case, I feel like the Waddlecopter might have been just about the only jump replacer that could have gotten us through these obstacles at all. Mr. Duder falls no problem, and now it's off to Onion Ocean. Onion Ocean has loads of water levels, which in this challenge play fairly similarly to normal gameplay. So you'd think it would be a pretty easy world. You'd think wrong. Because here's the deal. If you lose a copy ability underwater, there is no chance to get it back. That means every time Kirby gets hit while underwater is a real chance to permanently lose his ability and the jump replacement which came with it. Okay, sure, but what's the big deal? This is a challenge about Bandana Waddle Dee who can't lose his abilities. So what's it matter if Kirby loses his? Well, the thing is that oftentimes we need Kirby's copy ability once the water section ends to be able to remount. That means that in some sections, losing a copy ability during them is a total death sentence. This turns these underwater levels into quite tense escort missions, essentially. But that's generalities. Let's get into some specifics. This section of stage 2 is rearing up to be extraordinarily annoying in light of the fact that dry land is so far away from where we need to land. We of course can't use the watercopter from the surface of the water, so game over then, right? Well. Not quite, as the tap to get out of the water has been extraordinarily buffed in this remake, meaning we don't need a jump replacement at all to overcome this so-called obstacle. Stage 3, on the other hand, was an absolute menace. The whole thing is filled with these quick currents that we need to navigate both Kirby and Waddle Dee through safely. Even more worrying is the fact that after all of this, Bandana Waddle Dee and Kirby are spat out right here. And if Kirby doesn't have a copy ability with a jump replacement at this point, he can't get on Waddle Dee, and we can't progress. Therefore, we need to be extremely careful as we navigate at high speeds, because even one hit on Kirby has the potential to scuttle our whole attempt of this level. And even once you do get Kirby through copy ability intact, getting past these totems without destroying them is a very precise process that even required a little damage boosting at one point, but it can be done. Then stage 4 is relatively easy. Aside from this one section where you've got to bring in a third player to get through the door, but uh, it's, it goes alright. These waterfalls in the next world prove to be our next major hurdle. Once again, flowing water proves to be our Achilles heel. It is just so annoying to have to navigate both Bandana Waddle Dee and Kirby through this. On the bright side, at least losing one's copy ability here is at the end of the world, as you can always use the waterfalls themselves to remount. Well, until you get to this part, that is. Unless you do this. Thank goodness that worked. Then the next stage doesn't go any easier with these ice cannons. Luckily, proper timing can get you through those. Then we got the band back together for the next stage in order to transport keys. And one combat later, we're at Nutty Dune. The first stage of Nutty Dune is practically built for Bandana Waddle Dee. If you ignore this vertical section where you have to repeatedly charge up your waddlecopter in midair. I guess you've just gotta make sure there aren't any enemies directed below you while you're doing that. Easier said than done, but possible at least. Then it's easy going until stage three. Our problems here are twofold. Firstly, we cannot hang on the ropes with a Kirby on our back. Now that alone wouldn't spell our doom. Were it not for the fact that the wind here makes charging the waddlecopter on one of the few platforms you can rest on 
near impossible, and in many cases, literally impossible. Which, unfortunately, makes this level impossible. This ledge here is as far as our watocopter gets us. You obviously can't charge from here without falling off. So from here, we must jump. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. Luckily from here, we can get to this ledge without jumping. If we take some damage and lose a copy ability. But hey, uh, that's future CBCraft's problem. Now as for the present, I thought that maybe I could get to this next level from here. But the wind simply wouldn't allow it. But just like before, what can be done is get to this little ledge here. And jumping from here gets us up to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 jumps. But we're not out of the woods yet. This is a very small platform in its own right. Again, we can't charge the watercopter while remaining on it. Luckily, the next platform we're going to is close enough that we can afford a bit of a fall on the way there. And there we find a sword. So yay, future Seamcraft's issues did not materialize after all. And with that, that terrible level is behind us. Though it certainly took its toll. Stage 4 had more ropes, but this time there were also ladders which we can actually grab onto, so it went much smoother. And the rest of Nutty Noon was basically just boss fights, so no problems here. Now for Egg Engine. Waddle-Dee's movement wasn't great for taking on Stage 1 of Egg Engine due to how much of a rush you've got to be in. But, as long as you've got the patience to take breaks and let the enemies pass at certain points, he can most certainly get the job done. Stage 2 was then actually extremely easy. The same couldn't be said for Stage 3. Hello, ludicrously fast conveyors. Let me give it to you straight. It is impossible to react quickly enough with the watercopter to dodge all the obstacles these conveyors throw at you, at the rate they throw them at you. But, with trial and error, you don't have to react to the obstacles. You instead charge your copter well in advance, and know exactly when to activate it and when to land to start the process over anew. But once you've got it down, the sight is glorious. Oh, but do watch out. A bit after that section, there is this section, which you only get one shot at, and uh, you'd better go fast. And honestly, after that, the rest of Egg Engine, while interesting at points, never rises to such levels of difficulty. That brings us to Dangerous Dinner, where Stage 2, after a knockdown, drag out elevator fight, presents us with this. Yeah, the watercopter just does not possess the sort of verticality, and certainly not with such speed, to be able to get us past this section. And since we're playing as Waddle Dee, we can't just switch to high jump and get past it. That means we're stuck with regular jumps. Specifically, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them. Bringing our total to 35. And you've still got to deal with this crushing section after that. It's tough, and you basically can't make a mistake, but eventually you learn which obstacles to throw for, and which to copter for, which gets you through just in the nick of time. And then the stage 3 casually throws the hardest boss fight in the whole game at us. Dubior on moving platforms. The major issue here is, of course, the platforms. This is because our approach to the boss fights thus far has been to just sort of let Kirby hang out blocking while Bandana Waddle Dee does all the work. 
Of course, in this case, Kirby would die if we did that. So this time, we actually have to try to avoid taking damage in the boss fight. Extreme conservatism in our fighting proved to be the answer, allowing us to get through with Kirby on our back for most of the fights. And like I said, that was the hardest boss fight in the game, meaning that the remaining ones were easier and therefore possible. So, is it possible for Bandana Waddle Dee to beat Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe without jumping? No. Due to just two levels, 35 jumps are in fact necessary to beat the game. As it turns out, being locked into effectively one cop ability, especially one as specialized as Spear, there's a real number on one's ability to adapt to all the circumstances you have to, to be able to get through the run. But we gave it a good shot and had a good time. So there's that at least. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you may want to check out my other Kirby challenges, especially the normal no jump challenge for this game, as well as the no jump challenge for Maglor Epilogue. I'd also very much appreciate if you left this video a like and perhaps even a comment as well. Additionally, if you want to support this channel, you may want to consider joining my Patreon to get access to videos like this one a whole 24 hours early. Like these fine individuals on screen, especially the $15 tier patron, Ashford says. You also may want to check out the card game I designed, Time Travel Entertainment Incorporated. Uh, but anyways guys, until next time, I have been Seamcraft, speeding off to the next challenge. Goodbye.